Hi, how was your first date with uh, European poetry? I hope you enjoyed it. Well, here am I with, uh, uh, you know, with full vigor, ready to take you on a second date with uh, European poetry. Are you game to this? Do you think you in, you'll enjoy this? All right, okay. In the last class, let's quickly recap what we did. We discussed uh, the poetry of uh, Vasco Popa, a major Serbian poet uh, who has had a tremendous influence on, uh, you know, uh, the poetry of Ted Hughes and of course uh, in the collective imagination of the world and how his poetry offers uh, an extraordinary alternative to uh, the warmongering uh, uh, political mind as an alternative to the warmongering political mind. His poetry offers with uh, a rich imaginative lyrical uh, verse so that you know uh, the soil that is, uh, mm, I mean, the land that's uh, bathed of river, uh, bathed in the river of uh, blood, can now you know bathe in the river of uh, or in the ocean of uh, creativity and imagination. That's an alternative uh, vision he offers. And after that, we uh, went ahead and discussed how, under similar circumstances. Uh, here in Russia, you know, there in Re Serbia, we discussed uh, Vasco Popa, and here in Russia, under similar circumstances, uh, how Anna Akhmatova uh, wrote her poetry, you know, and how uh, you know her poetry today uh, offers a kind of uh, you know a ray of hope for all the disenfranchised uh, people, victims of uh, the totalitarian regimes you know, how the poet uh, gives us a glimpse of an indomitable spirit that is always inherent in, uh, in the body of poetry. So, let us continue that discussion today with, uh, you know, another uh, extraordinary poet. You know, this time we have, uh, you know, let us uh, go to uh, Poland, you know, let us come to Poland and uh, mm, discuss the poetry of uh, Poland's uh, major poet, okay. Here is uh, Milos, again a major 20th century voice, Szesla Milos, a major uh, Polish uh, translator, poet, prose writer, diplomat, and uh, you know, may very many things. And of course, he also later went on to win uh, Nobel Prize for Literature probably in uh, 1980, okay, just check the year, but one of the major Nobel laureates, uh, you know, and also a diplomat. Of course, now is the time for us to know a little bit about uh, the life of uh, Milos. He was uh, a Polish American uh, poet, of course, uh, he has his roots in Poland, but during that time, again, due to the political turmoil and Poland, his parents had to seek asylum away in Lithuania. So, he was born in Lithuania of uh, Polish origin, born to a wealthy civil engineer and uh, later he went on to uh, become a diplomat. You know, he also served as a, a diplomat of uh, Poland in the US and later he for various reasons he has to seek asylum in uh, Paris. So, again his life is also marked by a lot of uh, you know lows, uh, you know ebbs and highs and uh, lows. Uh, and he is also a, 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 a political prisoner, he was also you know uh, witnessed, he has also witnessed first hand uh, violence of uh, uh, totalitarian regimes and seek asylum elsewhere. Nevertheless, his poetry offers uh, extraordinary insights into understanding uh, human nature and uh, human love. Again, quite at an early age, he published uh, his uh, first poetry collection, you know, and he found, co founded a literary group called Zagri in 1931, which played a major role again in uh, spreading uh, poetry across. Uh, uh, his society across his land. His poetry first collection comes out in 1932. After the second world war, well, 
he went to the United States as a, a diplomat, as a Poland's diplomat. And of course, he was also later, uh, he also later served in Paris, you know. Uh, having lived under the two great totalitarian systems of modern history, which is uh, National Socialism and Communism. And this is really unfortunate, right? Both of them ideologically talk of uh, building a utopia. And probably what uh, uh, they don't realize is that, you know, under, uh, under the chimera of utopia lies, uh, you know, uh, a direct uh, route to hell. That's the reason why it's very unfortunate that, you know, those uh, ideologies, you know, those two governments that uh, came riding on, uh, came riding high on the ideologies of socialism and communism uh, resorted to a lot of violence and themselves turned to, you know, uh, turned the evils that they thought they were fighting against. That's uh, the irony, okay. So, he had to endure those two oppressive systems. And that is the reason why you find in his poetry a kind of an ironic style and his poetry is marked by a, a tragic note, you know, the, a kind of tragedy lurks somewhere behind his poetry, you know, that is some, we can perceive it like, uh, you know, Charlie Chaplin's behind the laughter, you know, behind the comedy of Ch Charlie Chaplin uh, lurks tragedy of modern society. So, behind the writings of Milos also, you know, you can find uh, shades of uh, tragedy. Nevertheless, what is important is how they affirm uh, human life, how they uh, sing virtues of hope and courage. Because, uh, you know, what can, uh, how do you face uh, a totalitarian regime? How do you face an oppressive system, especially as an individual or as a uh, groups of small individual, as small groups of individuals, when you are pitted against a, a huge system, a behemoth, you know, how do you fight that? Unless we keep a ray of hope in us, unless we are mad and somehow we believe that, you know, even our, uh, you know, even when there is, you know, hoping against hope, you know, uh, desperate hope, unless uh, we are mad to believe in these things, there is no ray of hope. So, fortunately, Milos kept it and his poetry is uh, highly reflective of that kind of, uh, you know, mad hope, something like that. Uh, even later, though he acted as a diplomat under uh, the government of uh, Poland and served his country in various other nations, uh, his relationship uh, did not last long. The relationship with the government soared and it deteriorated as a result of which later, you know, he had to seek an asylum in France. Uh, that is probably true of all uh, great revolutionary poets, right? Because uh, if there is one thing uh, that they have faced, they have realized the value of words. In fact, uh, words in are, you know, in the, in the true spirit, words are revolutionary. They always nurture within them. They always nurture within their, uh, you know, uh, semiotic dimension, uh, a flame of revolution, a flame of revolution. So, his, like, you know, it keeps waiting, that flame of uh, revolution for the betterment of society that keeps, uh, you know, waiting for good poets to come and when it finds good poems or good poets, it seeps into their poetry. So, Milos was fortunate enough to have found that kind of flame in his uh, poetry. So, and of course, later he joined the uh, University of California and uh, began teaching Polish uh, literature. And today, uh, Milos's work is known for its uh, classic style while engaging on the one hand with the political debates of his time and philosophical issues of his time, it was, it also opened another uh, door, another channel of communication open with, uh, you know, the classics, with the works of the past, with the works of the legends. That is how you find a beautiful combination of the tradition and, uh, you know, the present uh, in his works. So, 
when somebody later asked them uh, uh, how does one become a great poet, he said you know he did not mention craft, he did not mention experience, he said as long as one is true to oneself, remaining true to oneself is the hallmark of a great poet or great poetry. Uh, so, this is something that uh, uh, is significant you know. So, uh, again uh, another interesting quote this is from in defense of poetry uh, for an excerpt from there. The creative act is associated with a free feeling with a feeling of freedom that that is in its turn born in the struggle against apparently invisible resistance right of course his uh, i mean these lines characterize poetry of anna akhmatova poetry of vasco popa and poetry of another major poet that uh, we are about to discuss in a very short uh, while uh, almost you know considered national poet of uh, greece rizzos so this is uh, prophetic these words are prophetic uh, in their uh, best sense the creative act embodies in its core the spirit of freedom which is born which itself is a consequence of uh, a kind of resistance it is born in the face of resistance whoever truly creates is alone that's the reason why you know a creative writer most of the times uh, feels alone because uh, you know well if you are under the impression that you know writing is for fun of course it's true it's uh, it's true but when you take it to the next level, when you take your poetry, when you take your writing to the next level, you realize that you are alone. Like uh, you remember the great uh, Greek character Tiresias, who was blind, but who was bestowed with uh, you know some kind of trikalagnana. He could see the past, he could see the future, and when it, when somebody commented that he must be really lucky to have that kind of a knowledge, he said, "You don't know. It's a kind of a curse that I carry. Let no man be." you know let no man be cursed with the knowledge that I have on my shoulders. So, knowing future is truly a curse and unfortunately most of uh, these great writers carry that curse within, within them that is why they say that you know they are alone in their best creative moments they are alone, lonely, desperate and uh, so therefore creativity comes, great imagination comes uh, uh, out of the womb of despair right you know out of the womb of despair uh, hopelessness comes the great ray of hope uh, that is uh, it, it is uh, you know that is the paradox that is the greatest paradox of creativity. The creative man has no choice but to trust his inner command and place everything at stake in order to express what seems to him to be true we have realized this that you know if you are ready to uh, ferry yourself along wherever the truth takes you that is when you can be a true poet. You cannot just modify what you discover because the political regimes that you are living in do not like it you cannot modify that. If you are doing it you are not a great writer that is when you are misusing your position as a creative writer of course many writers do not realize that we are concerned with those writers uh, you know who matter to us a lot. Okay. Uh, yeah, though Milos is primarily known as a poet, he is also well known for his collection of essays called The Captive Mind. Uh, captive Mind illustrates uh, the process of how uh, poetry emerges uh, under these kind of circumstances, uh, especially it is a remarkable book for budding writers, budding poets. So, you may if you are really aspiring to be a writer, if you are nurturing the ambition of becoming a writer, you can please uh, uh, at least read some parts of uh, uh, this particular collection of essays, The Captive Mind. Uh, and of course, it is also noted for its insights into the lure of Stalinism to intellectuals, its adherence, thought process and the nuances of dissent and collaboration with the post-war Soviet bloc. We have discussed how all these uh, you know systems that rode high on greatest ideologies turned into oppressive regimes themselves you know very ironic very sad state and highly tragic. Uh, for exploring all these things he received a Nobel Prize in 1980 alright. So, now having known him let us uh, you know 
uh, take a dip in his uh, poetry, at least a couple of uh, this uh, couple of his poems. Okay, gift. A day so happy. In fact, uh, it's like you know these are fragments. These are no complete sentences. Just like uh, you know different phrases, incomplete clauses, phrases. And look how you know using broad brush strokes, using broad verbal strokes. Uh, this particular poem constructs uh, a picture. A day so happy. Fog lifted early. I worked in the garden. Hummingbirds were stopping over honeysuckle flowers. There was nothing on earth I wanted to possess. I knew no one worth my envying him. Whatever evil I had suffered, I forgot. To think that once I was the same man did not embarrass me. In my body, I felt no pain. When straightening up, I saw the blue sea and sails. Again, earlier, uh, recall in one of our earlier classes, we were discussing moments of uh, epiphany, right? Uh, moments of epi epiphany is a, is, a, is a very beautiful word, you know, please uh, pick this word up if you haven't already picked it up. You know, this is like an outburst of realization, a sudden outburst of your realization and whatever may be the trigger. In fact, it's said that, you know, uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa felt his uh, first uh, taste of uh, epiphany when he came across, you know, birds, uh, Larks flying across, uh, you know, the sky. He just had to watch it. You know, that was his first taste. You know, so there are many instances uh, where you can feel moments of epiphany. In fact, in the Mahabharata itself, uh, you know, when uh, Krishna had to reveal his uh, Virat Darshana, that's a moment of epiphany for you know people like Bhishma, Vidura, and those who could see. You know, epiphany is that kind of a sudden realization. It it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bursting out. You are burst out. Something within you bursts out, bursts out, and you realize something great has happened. Probably, so that's why he calls this poem a gift. So something has happened to him. Uh, a, he has found a door to miracle. You know, he has somehow found a door to miracle, and he has accidentally found it. That's why he calls it gift. And when that happens, he says, "I do not envy anybody because." These uh, pettiness, envying, jealousy, anger, these are all products of petty minds, right? So, he says, I did not, for a moment, I did not feel pain, I did not suffer, I did nothing, you know, I felt that. And, uh, and I am not the same man, you realize, see, we, uh, I mean, remember, there is again a famous uh, Zen saying, uh, a river is not same at its two points of flow. You know, supposing here is uh, a particular river at point A, here is river at point B. So, though technically it's one river, you know, but it's not one river. That's what Zen says. So, I'm not the man I was a moment ago, not even a second ago. So, we keep changing. This talks about, you know, uh, the principle of evolution, the cosmic spiritual principle of evolution that uh, all of us are in, whether we like it or not. Okay? So, the poem talks about that in a very beautiful, extraordinary way. Yeah. And this is another uh, extraordinary poem, you know, a remarkable poem. And in fact, uh, I have seen this poem uh, being used in ma many uh, heartfulness classes, mindfulness classes, happiness classes and all that uh, and rightly so it has uh, you know uh, uh, it can also be read as a prayer it can also be read as a prayer uh, a poem that has found uh, a wide circulation in areas that uh, probably we did not uh, we did not anticipate so a wide widely accepted poem love and the poet here talks of love not in any romantic sense of the term or not in any familial sense of the term or not even in any national sense of the term, you know. Love here is, you know, uh, it is uh, in a liberating sense. Love here is used in a liberating sense of the soul in, uh, you know, in that or in a liberating sense uh, where we realize uh, how indebted we are to nature, how indebted we are to the world that created us 
and it is a moment of aligning ourselves onto the higher dimension, onto, an, onto a higher pedestal. So, realization, a love of self, you know, a love of one to the self, something like that. Love means to learn to look at yourself the way one looks at distant things. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, you know. Love means to learn to look at yourself the way one looks at distant things. Can we do that? Can we look at ourselves as we look at any other being? So, here is a process of uh, nuding ourselves out, bearing ourselves out. You know, we are basically narcissists. All of us are obsessed with ourselves. If we can learn to look at ourselves as we look at others, that means, if we can learn to look at ourselves as part of a wider network around, then it leads to a beautiful path. It leads to unlocking a, you know, a door to another dimension. For you are only one thing among many, right? We are not, the, we behave as if we are the only supreme beings in the universe. If we are under the impression, we are definitely under delusion. There is no other, uh, greater delusion than that. No, not when I am saying I, not just human beings, I mean, you know, we are, we are definitely human beings are not the cream of creation. What makes you think that, you know, you are the cream of creation, you and I are the cream of creation. We are just part, you know, we occupy in this universe or we occupy in this nature as much significance as an ant has or as a leaf has, you know, or as a buffalo has. You know, that is uh, that's when we realize this, when we learn to locate uh, our, when we locate, when we try to locate ourselves in relation to others, then it becomes an extraordinary feeling. So, that is precisely probably what the poem is saying. And whoever sees that way heals his heart. Here is, you know, when do you heal our heart? In fact, modern life, uh, you know, we are suffering from many maladies, anxiety, fear, fear psychosis, uh, many things, right. So, the process of healing begins from here, when we look at ourselves in relation to others. But that does not mean to say that we are diminishing ourselves. In fact, this is where we can recall what Saint Augustine said, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. Though the world is filled, populated with so many billions of people, things, many other, you know, creatures, God loves each of us as if we are alone here. I mean, history, you know, something like that. So, when we learn to connect ourselves with the nature around, probably that is when we feel this, again in a highly paradoxical way, you know. And, uh, there is another important book called Poetry Pharmacy and there again, uh, uh, you know, it talks of using poetry as medicine. In fact, Poetry Pharmacy is a, a popular uh, movement in, uh, in England now, you know, BBC also hosted a series on that, uh, you know, uh, Poetry Pharmacy using poetry, you know, small doses of poetry, short poems are prescribed to you. If you go to the uh, pharmacist, uh, and say you are suffering from this, you know, uh, the pharmacist, here the poet or uh, uh, an aficionado of poetry will give you a poem. So, that is when you can cure your heart of uh, that kind of uh, malady. So, when we realize this, then what happens without knowing it from various ills, a bird and a tree say to him, friend. When, when that happens, we, re we realize that a tree next to us, a bird sitting on it, call us and call you, hi, we are your friends now, something like that. That is the beauty, right. So, an extraordinary poem. So, from here, let us move on to uh, another poem on prayer. So, these again, these are all extraordinary poems. Of course, for want of uh, time and space and many things, uh, we will not be uh, dealing uh, with this poem in detail. We have to move on to another equally great poet. But you can read this poem a little later and see how much of it you can, uh, you know, grasp. Again, as I said, understanding poetry is not the be all and the end all. Uh, you have to perceive a poem, how much of it you can perceive using the uh, uh, things we have learned becomes important. Yeah. From uh, 
here Milos, let's go to Rizzo's, Yanis Rizzo's, an extraordinary Greece poet, a 20th century Greece poet. The moment we say Greek, uh, you know, we are automatically reminded of uh, all the Greek myths, legends, stories that we have heard of, heroic tales, epics, Homer, right? Of course, Yanis Rizzo, if you look at his poetry, it seems uh, he has successfully continued the rich Hellenic uh, cultural legacy in his uh, poem, again a 20th century, major 20th century product uh, and uh, many consider him as of course, uh, he is a, a, a committed uh, leftist, you know, he is a committed leftist, he, many consider him as uh, a major Greek uh, left uh, poet. Of course, even without uh, the tag left, he is still relevant to all of us. Uh, like the other poets we have been discussing, you know, this poet too had to undergo, you know, political oppression. He was a victim of, uh, you know, many things, even personal tragedies. He lost his father, he lost his mother, he lost his brother to tuberculosis. He himself, uh, you know, uh, had to get himself admitted and he was in hospital for several years. Uh, so, he was in a sanit sanatorium, you know, he was committed to a sanatorium for a long time. And uh, before he found his uh, calling, you know, in poetry, he worked many jobs. Uh, fortunately, in 1934, his first poetry collection comes tractors and since then, of course, there was no turning back. So, he found actually, it is like a calling to him, you know, he found his calling in uh, poetry. Uh, Again, so in 1934, he joins the Communist Party and remained faithful to it throughout, you know, though many criticize him for uh, his uh, blind faith because, uh, see, when you are a follower of an ideology, it is fine, but when you turn a blind eye towards uh, its pitfalls, that is when it becomes difficult uh, for others to digest, right? Because uh, uh, I mean, this is probably true for all ideologies. If somebody is drunk on an ideology, then that person will not be able to see the pitfalls of the ideology that he is uh, riding high on. So, that is a valid criticism against Rizzo, but of course, that does not diminish uh, uh, the importance of his poetry. His extraordinary poem, his extraordinary work, you know, Epitaphos, you know, appeared, it is called in fact to this day, even to this day it is called a stunning anthem of the Greek left. That is how it has been described as a stunning anthem of the Greek left. It appeared in 1936. In fact, uh, that was born out of violence that killed uh, hundreds of people and the next day when the newspaper reported of violence, in fact, it carried uh, the picture of a mother crying profusely before the dead body of her son and this particular picture moved him so much that he began composing it and even to this day of course, please recall one of our earlier classes how suffering leads to song, out of suffering co song comes shokam shlokatva magataha in the case of Valmiki we, we realize this you know shoka leading to shloka poetry, suffering uh, leading to song probably that is the reason why, you know, uh, uh, even Rabindranath Tagore said, at the moment of song, at the moment of despair and darkness, it is to song that we must turn. It is to song that we turn in the moments of despair and darkness, because again songs have the capacity, uh, an inbuilt capacity to uplift us. So, this is his uh, major work. Uh, yeah. During the Nazi occupation of Greece, uh, he joined uh, communist guerrillas and when that, uh, you know, when they were imprisoned, he too was imprisoned and incarcerated uh, for about uh, 5 years. And uh, later again in 67, he was uh, arrested and exiled. All these poets, you know, Anna Akhmatova, Milos, Vasco Popa that we discussed earlier, all of them, you know, they are uh, they have been persecuted like hell, uh, I mean uh, like, like hell. Uh, nevertheless, they did not lose hope. In fact, that is the reason why we are reading their poetry today. You know, their poetry has an extraordinary capacity to 
offer a ray of hope to all the citizens uh, who feel their rights are threatened uh, today. All right. Uh, and uh, he was a very prolific writer. He was a very, very prolific writer. Uh, more than 100 books uh, have been, uh, uh, you know, credited to him. So, he has uh, to his credit more than 100 books and uh, many of them were left unpublished, but later, uh, you know, they were published posthumously. He died in 1990. Uh, and this is where, this is a very significant uh, uh, quotation by, Jan, yeah, by Rizzo's, you know, he says, I know that each one of us travels to love alone, alone to fate and to death. I know it. I have tried it. It does not help. Let me come with you. I mean, I mean now you see what is, what he is doing here, what his poetry does. We are all alone, you know, our love to, I mean, these are all travels life. Uh, I mean, you, you agree with me, right? You know, our entire life is a journey, a huge one big journey, you know, from cradle to grave is a one big journey. You want to consider it a pilgrimage, travel, whatever you want it to, you know, it's, it entails a journey with it. So, so is to love. You have to discover your love alone. Nobody can help you on that. And so is the case with faith. You can, you, you, I mean, many may teach you, preach you and all that, but you have to discover your, your faith alone. You know, we have to discover our love alone, we have to discover our faith alone and we have to embrace death alone. And it is not an easy task. We feel lonely, we feel depressed and that is when he says, you know, let me come with you. What does he mean? Let my poetry come with you. So, he is offering his poetry as a kind of a companion to take with you in your eternal journey, an extraordinary line. His poetry ranges from uh, overtly political to deeply personal. Of course, that becomes evident when we take a look at his poetry. And his poetry is replete with uh, images of uh, Greek myths and legends uh, and all those things. He recreates, his poetry recreates uh, uh, the high point of Hellenistic culture, you know. And uh, this is precisely what he, in fact, uh, many consider him as a bard of loneliness a bard of loneliness, a poet of loneliness. But this loneliness is not of despair, but it is an ennobled loneliness and this loneliness can be overcome. That is the reason why it can be said that fighting in vain against our loneliness are our ultimate drive. You know, we can derive our drive from that fight against that loneliness and that is our deepest motivation. That is, his poetry demonstrated that. And that is why he offers his poetry as a companion in our, in our uh, struggle to come to terms with loneliness and grief and suffering. Fortunately, we find his poetic lines. Yeah, here is uh, a poem, The Meaning of Simplicity, a beautiful poem you can read, you know, I hide behind simple things, so you will find me, a kind of, you know, maybe he is uh, talking to his love, lady love. If you do not find me, you will find the things, you will touch what my hand was has touched, our hand prints will merge. Look how beautifully he is talking of love, you know, you if you do not meet, no problem, you know, you and I have walked on the same ground. So, our footprints will match, our hand prints will match. So, beautiful love, you know. Uh, uh, and again, this particular line, every word is a doorway to a meeting, one often cancelled. And that is when a word is true, when it insists on the meeting, how every word, the, I mean here word again, you know, it is a metaphor for probably a poem. It is a doorway when we come across a beautiful poem at the right moment, we do not know where that, uh, you know, takes us, what kind of turn it gives us, okay. And he is also well known uh, for uh, another poem of his called Injustice, you know. You can again read this poem uh, uh, when you are when you have, uh, you know, time on your hand, when you are leisurely, you can read this poem, poem and for want of, uh, again, time, we are rushing through this. So, uh, I am sure uh, having uh, come face to face with uh, these great, extraordinary, uh, remarkable 
poets, uh, I'm sure you have uh, enjoyed uh, and found some ray of hope and maybe some of you may have even found some kind of uh, a companion in their uh, poetry. So if they really excite you, please carry on with the journey. But remember, I will not be there with that, uh, you know, on your date. So you will have to carry your third date and subsequent dates on your own. Okay, all right, take care.